Welcome to the New South Wales Science and Research Breakfast Seminar, uh, the first one to be done uh, fully online uh, in the current conditions. I would first like to acknowledge uh, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, uh, whose land we are at least virtually meeting on uh, today. And I'd like to welcome Deep Marmola uh, for pioneering the presentation of the breakfast seminar uh, online. So Deep Mar is a professor of geophysics at the School of Geosciences at the University of Sydney. I've personally known uh, Deep Mar for well over 20 years now and uh, been involved with him in a number of projects. And Deep Mar is really at the forefront, not just of geoscience, but of applying computational methods, computing technology and visualization to the study of geoscience and geophysical uh, phenomena, and also for things like minerals discovery uh, and the environment. Uh, as you'll see, uh, Deepmar really uh, has managed also to help take that uh, science, take that technology and explain it to the world through a whole lot of different software, the virtual globe software, other software that his team, the Earthbyte team, have managed to make available. Uh, today, Deepmar is going to be talking about the future of geoscience. Um, what we have done in the last uh, few years, uh, where we're heading in Australia, and I think it's fair to say Australia you know, is a world leader in the area of geosciences and understand basically how geosciences will affect both society, uh, its need for energy, infrastructure and technology, uh, and water into the future. So uh, Dietmar, Dietmar's research is at the forefront of uh, geoscience, not just in Australia, but globally. He was an Australian Laureate Fellowship Fellow, uh, 2009 to 2014. He's a Fellow of the American Geophysical Union, a Fellow of the Australian Academy of Science. And in 2018, he was awarded the New South Wales Premier's Prize for Excellence in Mathematics, Earth Sciences, Chemistry and Physics. In 2019, he also received the Jaeger Medal of the Australian Academy of Sciences and the Clark Medal of the Royal Society of New South Wales for his contributions to the evolution of the solid Earth. I'd like you to welcome today uh, Dietmar. Thanks very much. Over to you, Dietmar. Thanks, Thanks very much for the introduction, Hugh, and good morning, everyone. It's a great pleasure to be a sort of Zoom trailblazer today in giving the first live streamed New South Wales Science and Research Breakfast Seminar on the future of geoscience in Australia. Australia's population is set to almost double by 2066. This means that we'll be asking more and more of our river water, groundwater, minerals and energy resources, as well as our physical environments, to meet these ever-growing needs. All the while, our climate is changing rapidly. A recent report from 222 scientists from 50 countries stated that cascading crises are the biggest threat to the well-being of future generations. Us geoscientists are tuning our expertise towards developing a predictive framework for geoscience to understand how our Earth and its resources have unfolded and, importantly, what they have yet to give. Within the national and global geoscience community, my own focus is on using Earth observation technologies and Earth modeling software to help locate water, mineral and energy resources. This image here conveys the multitude of geoscience subdisciplines. Many connections between physical processes with life on Earth and human society are also outlined in a recently published report entitled Our Future on Earth. The COVID-19 crisis has brought the relationship between human activities, natural resources and the environment into sharper focus for all of us. So today I want to focus on three topics, Earth observation from space, holistic Earth system models and the accelerated search for new mineral deposits. And we'll start off with talking about Earth observation from space. The Australian Space Agency was officially opened by our Prime Minister, Scott Morrison, in February this year. Its aim is to triple the size of the Australian space industry and create at least 20,000 new jobs by 2030. Earth observation from space, with its myriad applications, is right at the centre of its mission, especially seeing that the agency is led by an Australian geologist, Megan Clark. My talk today will be focused on the solid earth and the resources underneath the surface. This image illustrates an example of how satellite observations can contribute to the search for new mineral deposits underpinning the future green economy. What is shown here are two images captured by the Advanced Spaceborne Thermal Emission and Reflection Radiometer, ASTER in short. It's an imaging instrument on board Terra, the flagship satellite of NASA's Earth Observing System. 
One of its products is continent-wide mineral maps, including 15 mineral groups with a resolution between 15 to 90 meters. The image on the left shows iron oxide composition, which is related to the occurrence of gothite, used for making yellow ochre, and hematite, related to the occurrence of banded iron formations, which account for more than 60% of global iron reserves. The image on the right, focusing in on South Australia, uh, shows silica content, with high silica content being shown in blue and low silica content in green. We can use the silica, silica content to distinguish different rocks from each other. For example, silica with quartz, quartzite and distinguish it from um, low silica content rocks like carbonates or clay minerals. Next, we have the CubeSat revolution. CubeSats are small, block-shaped satellites. These mini satellites only measure 10 centimeters a side and weigh around 1.3 kilograms. They can be used for a wide range of applications. The idea behind these little boxes is pretty simple. It's sending things into space can cost millions of dollars. Sometimes a larger satellite leaves some spare room on the rocket and CubeSats can fill that space. Compared to the huge cost for a separate launch, the three-unit CubeSat can get orbital for around $240,000. These tiny satellites can measure ocean surface biological productivity and the constituents of the atmosphere, as well as they can host uh, rain radars. They can also collect magnetic and gravity field data, among many other things. Now we're zooming uh, into a more regional survey, not using satellite data, but airborne electromagnetic data as part of the Exploring for the Future program. It's designed to map mineral deposit host rocks and regional geological features across northern Australia by mapping electrical conductivity. This provides a detailed 3D picture of the crust, similar to a CT scan. We can also image the Earth using drones and swarms of them with somewhat different techniques, including laser ranging. An advantage of drones is that they can get into hard to reach places. And our next slide shows a good example for this. These two geologists here from Monash University are mapping fairly rough volcanic terrain that's quite inaccessible in the Canary Islands using drones. When they get back to the office, they can process and analyze the drone data to create a detailed structural map of faults and unstable surfaces within the volcano. As shown in the image on the right, <clears throat> the flood of remotely sensed data needs to be archived and made accessible to end users. This is done via the Australian Geoscience Data Cube, led by Geoscience Australia and hosted by the National Computational Infrastructure. The image shown here is a false color Landsat image acquired over part of the Georgina River, north of Lake Eyre in South Australia. Both remotely sensed data and computer models of the interior of the Earth need to be visualized interactively. Visualization centers, such as the one at Monash University shown here, can be used to visualize very large 3D data sets. What's shown here is a view of the 3D mechanical model of the Eastern Australian crust created by Professor Louis Moresi from ANU, exploring the dynamics of continental growth and deformation through time. Now we'll move on to holistic Earth models, and this is my favorite part of Earth science, modeling the entire Earth to understand its evolution through time and the complex ways that Earth, oceans, atmosphere, and surface environments interact together. You can see this complexity in the image on the left. Deep Earth convection driving tectonic plates and moving continents around at the surface with a variety of exchanges of fluids and gases between the atmosphere, oceans, and the solid Earth. The way we observe these dynamic processes is through an interconnected system of sensors and imaging equipment. We can liken this to a downward-looking telescope, which looks into the Earth and sends back to us streams of data, as shown in the illustration on the right. This virtual telescope, maintained by Oscope, has different lenses that allow us to look into the Earth in different ways and gather information about the chemistry and physical nature of the planet through time. Our EarthBite group at the University of Sydney is pursuing holistic Earth system models, connecting plate tectonics, the convection of Earth's mantle, and paleogeography, as well as paleoclimate models. But the collection of animations shown here illustrates how these different models are connected to each other. 
So for the last five years, the construction of these models has been supported by the Australian Research Council and industry supported Basin Genesis Hub, aimed at understanding the structure and evolution of sedimentary basins. Our approaches allow us to link rainfall with surface uplift and subsidence through time to model the processes that have shaped the Earth's surface over millennia, creating evolving river systems and resource-rich sedimentary basins. This research is enabled by the National Computational Infrastructure. It hosts Australia's fastest supercomputer, GADI, which went online in December last year and is 10 times more powerful than its predecessor, Rajin. Without this supercharged computing power, this research would be impossible. Over geological time, Earth evolution is entirely driven by plate tectonics. Plates move apart at mid-ocean ridges where new ocean crust is being formed while they converge along subduction zones uh, where o old oceanic plates are recycled deep into the Earth. All deep Earth resources owe their existence to plate tectonics and life on Earth would have unlikely evolved without it. This video created by my past PhD student, uh, Rakib Hassan, shows the evolution of the Earth's convecting mantle located between the Earth's core shown in green and the rigid surface plates over 230 million years. Over geological time, mantle rocks flow like warm toffee, driven by heat escaping from the Earth's core and generated by radioactive elements. Plate tectonics involves the recycling of old cold oceanic plates along subduction zones, shown in blue colors in this animation. They sink into the deep mantle, stirring its convective system and causing the formation of deep upwellings called plumes. These cylindrical structures with a mushroom-shaped head rise to the surface, you can see them very nicely in this animation, where they cause huge volcanic eruptions, which have been the cause of extinctions over geological time. The Pacific view is shown on the left, showing subduction along the circum-Pacific ring of fire, while the globe on the right is centered on Africa. The convecting mantle pushes the Earth's surface up in the regions around plumes and draws it down close to subduction zones, where recycled oceanic slab fragments are sinking, deforming the surface like a giant bubble board, as is schematically shown in the cartoon on the left. This effect is important to understand Australia's evolution. The video on the right shows the output of a mantle convection simulation. It starts 150 million years ago, and you see a timestamp in the upper left when Australia was still joined with Antarctica as part of Gondwana land. Red colors indicate surface uplift due to mantle upwellings, and blue colors surface subsidence caused by downwellings along subduction zones. And the subduction zones are shown as blue lines with triangles. Before 100 million years ago, the entire coast of New South Wales was lined by a subduction zone. It was not a quiet coastal landscape in those times when volcanic eruptions and large earthquakes would have made the daily news if humans had been around. The photo on the lower left shows the Bombo Quarry Volcanics, just two hours south of Sydney, close to Kayama, formed when a subduction zone lined Eastern Australia. I highly recommend a visit. I'm sure uh, quite a few of you uh, might have uh, seen it. In the beginning of the animation on the right, at 150 million years ago, Western Australia is located close to a huge mantle upwelling shown in red, centered west of India. Western Australia was topographically high at the time as a consequence, straddling this huge upwelling, while much of Eastern Australia was low-lying, nearly the opposite as it is today. During the breakup of Gondwana, Australia moves to the east, moving over this blue dynamic topography low, and this interaction between the eastward moving plate and this downwelling uh, drew the surface down. This process, together with the global sea level rise, created an inland sea in the Great Artesian Basin area, and around 100 million years ago, subduction and volcanism along the east coast of Australia came to a halt, and the forces that had pulled eastern Australia down gradually faded away, allowing the surface to rebound. Next, we'll have a look at how these processes affected Australia's surface evolution. This animation by my colleague Tristan Sal shows a model of Australia's surface topographic evolution over the last 150 million years. It's driven by a combination of plate tectonic, mantle convection, and paleoclimate models. Here we are showing Australia in a fixed reference frame, even though the dynamic model was constructed considering Australia's tectonic motion through time over the convecting mantle and through different climate zones. The model illustrates how Western Australia was high until about 100 million years ago, as I explained previously, pushed up by upward directed mantle currents, and you can see this very nicely right now. During the same time, Eastern Australia became inundated by an inland sea, 
uh, shown in green colors here and blue colors and many kilometers of shallow marine and river sediments were deposited in the Great Artesian Basin. After 100 million years ago, the Eastern Highland formed, partly eroding the sediments that were previously deposited um, with the ancient Seduna River transporting them to Australia's southern margin. So this story sort of emphasizes the very dynamic nature of landscapes and how they respond to deep earth forces and to climate change through time. These models allow us to understand how and when the Great Artesian Basin, shown on the left, was filled with sediments. How this happens is shown in the animation on the right, which illustrates where sediments were eroded in blue or deposited through time in red. The resulting sediment layers through time are shown in the middle, forward in time from top to bottom. The model demonstrates how the basin was filled with sediments through time, while erosion due to the uplift of the eastern highlands later truncated the basin in the east. Once we have an understanding of the basin's deep structure, we can then use these insights to inform resource exploration and management, including any resources formed in sedimentary basins. We'll focus on groundwater resources next. Here we have a model of the topography of Eastern Australia, roughly from Batemans Bay in the south to the northern coast of Queensland, with some elements of the geology of the Sydney Basin highlighted. The basement geology of the basin is shown in pink, while coal layers, mostly Permian in age, are shown in beige. Arrows indicate the magnitude and direction of groundwater flow through the basin and out of the basin. A 3D model like this can show us how groundwater flow is affected by relatively impermeable coal layers and how extraction of coal might alter the flow of groundwater. Here we see a close-up of the southern Sydney Basin region, focusing in on the region between Wollongong and Newcastle in the foreground. The large black arrows show the discharge of groundwater from the continent into the ocean. This is one of the primary mechanisms by which groundwater is recycled back into the oceans and this process may become enhanced by future sea level rise. While low salinity groundwater housed within aquifers is still thought to be abundant, its distribution pathways and capacity vary considerably depending on local geology. Using groundwater modeling software integrated with Sydney Basin geology, as shown here, we can simulate how fluids move through the rocks and how these processes might change in the future. The last part of my talk is dedicated to searching for new mineral deposits. This recent article in The Australian highlighted the importance of mining in Australia's recovery after the COVID-19 pandemic in a world where a shift to lower emissions will drive increased demand for new metals and rare, rare earth elements used in renewable energy and batteries. This fascinating article appeared on the 11th of May in AI Daily this year. It claims that the world's first trillionaire will make their innumerable fortune in space through mining asteroids. The space minerals extracted from the asteroids could be transported back to Earth to supply the ever-growing demand for critical minerals. If you're wondering how much these asteroids are worth, Asterank, a scientific and economic database of over 600,000 asteroids, lists over 500 asteroids that are worth more than $100 trillion. According to NASA, the minerals located in the asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter hold enough wealth equivalent to 100 billion for every person on Earth. Now that's quite an eye-watering statistic. The next image here shows what it might look like capturing an asteroid. Not for the faint-hearted. You might need to hire Matt Damon or Matthew McConaughey to get this job done. This article here, also from the 11th of May, highlighted the rising demand for battery metals, which include lithium, cobalt, nickel, manganese, and graphite. How will the supply of these metals be satisfied before we can catch asteroids, which might be some time off, to be honest? Some companies think that applying artificial intelligence to mineral exploration on Earth might help. In its January-February 2020 issue, The Atlantic reported that history's largest mining operation is about to begin. What you might not have guessed is that this operation is happening in the deep sea, as opposed to anywhere on the continents. This is about deep sea polymetallic nodules. They are an economic prospect for critical and rare earth metals in a world increasingly reliant on green and high technologies. 
the huge demand for copper, cobalt, lithium, and nickel as electric vehicle uptake increases has prompted mining company Deep Green and others to focus on the deep ocean, where polymetallic nodules are abundant in some regions. So what exactly are these polymetallic nodules? The round dark concretions or stones pictured on the left, resembling uh, potatoes or golf balls found uh, on the surface of abyssal plains of the world's oceans at water depths between four and six and a half kilometers. They are composed of metal rich layers, especially rich in manganese and iron, but also other metals and rare earth elements. Polymetallic nodules grow extremely slowly at a rate of only millimeters to several centimeters per million years. In one of Earth science's most enduring mysteries, they somehow managed to remain on the seafloor despite their locations and areas where clay accumulate, accumulates at least 100 times faster. So in theory, they should get buried um, very quickly, and we know that they would stop growing once they're buried. <clears throat> in a recent project led by Earthbiter Adriana Dutkiewicz, shown in the photo on the right, we combined open access data for thousands of polymetallic nodules with digital data sets of ocean environmental parameters to create a machine learning model that ranks the factors controlling nodular currents. We created a map that predicts where polymetallic nodules are most likely to occur. In the Sydney Uni news piece shown, on, shown here, this work was described as opening Davy Jones locker. Now, most of you will probably ask, what on earth is Davy Jones locker? David John's locker is an idiom for the bottom of the sea. It's used as a euphemism for shipwrecks in which the sailors and ships remains are consigned to the depths of the ocean. Unfortunately, we have yet to develop a machine learning algorithm to detect drowned pirates and their riches. This is our global map of the probability of nodules occurring on the seafloor with red colors indicating high probability. The tiny black dots are nodule locations while the white dots represent our control locations where nodules are known to be absent. You'll notice that nodules are particularly common in parts of the equatorial Indian and Pacific oceans. The International Seabed Authority is currently preparing new environmental regulations to govern deep sea mining. Our analysis represents a global data-driven synthesis to impartially inform these policies and deep sea environmental management. In particular, our results indicate that these nodules are most strongly associated with relatively high abundances of seafloor fauna. This was actually uh, one of the biggest surprises of our global study, also backed up by other independent research at several deep sea localities, namely that many deep sea species rely on the nodules as habitats. Organisms such as starfish, octopods, and mollusks seem to keep the nodules at the seafloor surface by foraging, burrowing, and ingesting sediment on and around them. Careful management of the environmental impacts of deep sea mining will clearly be essential. The last part of my talk will focus on copper. Society's demand for copper is growing exponentially with world consumption of copper over the next 25 years, expected to exceed all copper metal ever mined to date. But why does copper matter? As we enter a new era of global industrialization and technological innovation, demand for the red metal will see unprecedented growth because the future is electric and copper is a key enabler. The Andean copper belt is one of the most important regions for copper mining because of its abundant copper deposits, often paired with gold and other metals along the Pacific Ring of Fire. The Ring of Fire owes its name to all the volcanic activity along the edge of the continents around the Pacific. This is a photo of a central Chilean copper mine in the Los Andes province. Two recent discoveries were made here close to the surface, but deeper exploration will be required for future discoveries. Regions of the crust deeper than 200 meters are very poorly explored, so it's quite clear that only the deposits very close to the surface have been explored so far. We have developed a new approach to get clues where to look for more deeply buried copper and gold ore deposits that are common um, along Andean type mountain belts. We reconstruct geological, geophysical, and ore deposit data in a plate tectonic context. The animation on the left shows how the tectonic plates have moved over the last 230 million years. Pacific Ring of Fire subduction zones are shown as blue lines with triangles focusing in on the eastern Pacific here. 
Young ocean crust is colored red, while crust with increasing age is colored green and blue. Ore deposits are shown as small dots colored by their geological age. The age of the ocean crust that's subducting is an important parameter in ore formation. You'll notice that ore deposits form in clusters at particular locations and times, rather than randomly through space and time. We want to find the key parameters that characterize the tectonic environments leading to ore deposit clusters. But our model has 24 tectonic parameters, hence the need for machine learning approaches to analyze this hyperdimensional space. In our multidimensional analysis, we find that four out of these 24 parameters are of key importance. These are an ultra-fast convergence rate between plates, not head-on, but oblique convergence, the relatively old age and thick sediments of the downgoing oceanic plate, and a location towards the middle of a long mountain bed as opposed to the edges. These parameters are proxies for channeling large amounts of fluids down the subduction zone, which helps create melts, while identifying places where the crust is being severely thickened and faulted, another prerequisite for these particular deposits to form. On the right, I show a map of the probability of ore deposits forming um, along the Andes um, based on these parameters. And we are focusing in on the maximum pro probability here, the, the peak uh, probabilities that have occurred sometime during the geological history of each one of these places shown here. High probabilities are shown in red and low probabilities in blue. You'll notice different red colored high likelihood provinces from Patagonia to the central Andes and they have different ages. So in the future we will add detailed regional geological and geophysical data to this type of analysis. We do have such deposits closer to home as well. This is the Cadia Copper Gold District in New South Wales, with the largest known metal endowment for a deposit of this type in the world. <clears throat> to identify the geodynamic environments where such older deposits have formed, we need tectonic models going back much further than the formation of the Andes, a relatively young mountain belt. <clears throat> the video playing here shows our latest plate tectonic model going back a billion years. You can see Australia moving around at the bottom right. In this animation, an ancient supercontinent called Rodinia initially forms, but then breaks apart, disperses, until a new supercontinent forms around 300 million years ago called Pangaea, by means of a collision between Gondwana in the south and Laurasia in the north. And you'll see this happening soon in this animation. You see ancient ocean basins in white with continents in gray and colored arrows showing plate speed and direction. Importantly, you can also see the edges of the plates shown as blue lines. This is where all the action happens, especially along subduction boundaries where plates converge. Focus in on the lines with small triangles. They are the places where we expect intense volcanism and crustal faulting to occur and where we expect ore deposits to form. Ore deposits like those found along the Andes are shown as purple, green, yellow, and red dots, depending on the age of formation. Note the many clusters of copper gold ore deposits that have formed along the South and North American margins, as well as along Southern Eurasia. And there's quite a few in Eastern Australia. For all the exploration geologists out there listening to this talk, these next two slides are especially for you. Because you might think, well, our uh, deep time data analysis is interesting, but how do we actually do small scale exploration better? Once the search for an ore deposit has been narrowed down to a small region, we can use a smart optimization method for finding the optimal placement of the next drill hole using a probabilistic approach called multi-objective Bayesian optimization. We build an initial 3D model of the subsurface based on a combination of available geophysical and geological data with uncertainty estimates. This model is successfully refined as new drill data become available and each new hole is placed to maximize new information gained and to minimize cost. This animation here shows for two case studies how consecutive placements of drill sites would reduce the uncertainty of the 3D model of the subsurface based on the combination of geophysical and geological data. The example on the left involves four buried ore bodies, while the one on the right is a single granite intrusion surrounded by mineral-rich sediments. 
The color of the two 3D models at the top highlights rock density, with low density rocks being yellow, while high density rocks are shown in green. On the left, the ore deposits, which are the target, have a lower density than the surrounding rocks. So they are shown in greenish yellowish colors, while on the right, the sediments surrounding the granite have a lower density than the granite body in the center. And so here the sediments along the edges of the box are shown in yellow. The cubes at the bottom of the image illustrate the mean density distribution of our rock volume projected onto the base of the cube for easier visualization and the uncertainty distribution driven by the data and as changes with increasing drill sites being placed strategically. The optimal location where to place a new drill site is determined by maximizing information gain, giving existing data, while minimizing cost. Sometime in the future, this kind of software might become a standard tool, uh, not only for playing optimal drill site locations, but also for acquiring strategically placed uh, geophysical surveys. All the work that I've shown today is based on open source software, including the work with our industry partners. Open access resources are critical for scientists from different domains who work together to tackle important challenges and big questions of our time. In a post-COVID world, in challenging economic circumstances, open source software will be a low-cost way of doing research by industry, government, and universities alike. It is also critical for the education of future geoscientists. And we have made it to the end of my talk. The science is not only for hardcore researchers. With our open source software, you can actually build your own virtual planet at home, or at least interactively visualize our different planetary layers by visiting our GPlace portal. Thank you for listening. And I've deliberately left a lot of time for questions instead of me talking for an hour. Thank you. Uh, unfortunately, we don't get the applause uh, in the virtual world in the same way, but uh, take it from me, uh, there's, there's lots of applause out there. And Dima, I have to disappoint you, we've, we've uh, not managed to uh, work out the question answering mechanism uh, <laughs> because I've... <laughs> But, and I have to say it's my fault entirely. Uh, so uh, there won't be the only questions you're going to get are from me, I'm afraid. Um, but I might I might uh, just put a couple to you if you don't mind. Sure. Uh, the first one really is around uh, planetary geology. Uh, there's a lot of talk about uh, mining the moon, for example, and yet my very rudimentary understanding of geology is it's unlikely that there would be any mineralization on the moon. So what is this talk about mining on the moon? Yeah, um, I, 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 I don't think uh, um, uh, that the mineral potential of the moon is uh, particularly enticing. I mean, and this is the, the, the reason why um, uh, people are actually uh, uh, focusing on asteroids instead, because they are much more metal rich than any place uh, in the moon uh, would be. Uh, so, so I think Mining the moon is perhaps more uh, of a of a political gimmick. Okay, uh, and then it worries me slightly, if you don't mind me saying, trying to bring an asteroid to Earth. Isn't that what caused the extinction of the dinosaurs? Yes, well, I, that was a particularly large one. I think the the the, the sort of asteroids that uh, uh, that some people are envisioning uh, to capture uh, would be much smaller than the one that wiped out the uh, dinosaurs, right? so they come in all sorts of sizes. And uh, I, well, I think in, in reality, I imagine it would be um, quite a challenge uh, to, to actually go and, uh, and capture an asteroid and, and bring it back to the Earth safely. Um, yeah. um, but uh, 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 we, we have had um, a probe uh, landing on an asteroid and actually sampling it. And so yes, we know that yeah. we can actually uh, get to one, land on it, sample it. So uh, since we've gotten this far, it is likely possible to, to actually uh, somehow capture it and, uh, and bring it back to Earth. Now, how long it will take for us uh, to get there with the technology, uh, I'm not sure. So one of the things that I've been trying to push in these seminars, Dietmar, is the, uh, uh, the potential uh, prosperity or wealth creation benefits of the science that we do uh, in the state. Um, and I'd just like your thoughts. I mean, I've, I've always been very interested in geology uh, and in minerals uh, and in resources. 
but how how can we take the sort of work that you've been doing, uh, both in a digital sense uh, and in other areas, uh, to genuinely sort of create uh, those sorts of maybe corporate or prosperity outcomes, or I don't know, re mineral recovery outcomes, those sorts of things. Yeah, so that's a, that's an excellent question. And uh, uh, so I'm, I'm actually um, uh, involved in, in discussions uh, with, a, with a major exploration and mining company um, to further develop uh, these concepts to, to ultimately um, perhaps uh, form a startup company and, uh, and really develop the commercial potential of uh, some of the technologies that I've highlighted uh, to, today. And so I, I very much hope uh, that we will be able to do that over the next few years. And uh, of course, the enticing pro prospect is that the technologies that we are developing uh, could be applied anywhere. And so, so it's not just that, that we are focused on exploring, say, in New South Wales. And the, the idea is rather um, that, that, that we become global leaders um, in developing um, uh, technologies and solutions um, for um, uh, making um, mineral exploration and mining more intelligent, uh, um, if you like. And so you have a long history of, of course, being involved in, in driving more intelligent uh, robotic uh, mining. Um, but I think the, the, the same, the same um, uh, methods have, are only starting to be applied um, to exploration. And I think this is partly um, because exploration was relatively easy for a long time um, because there were plenty of deposits right at the surface of the earth. And uh, so, so you didn't need very sophisticated methods to find them, right? And this is, probably, for example, this is the case for the rich iron ore deposits in uh, Western Australia. They're right at the surface. Okay. Uh, I mean, uh, related to that, I mean, you know, in the time that I've known you, uh, I think geology has almost changed beyond recognition. You know, there was a time when we... Uh, you know, geology was about going out with a pickaxe uh, and measuring things. Uh, and now, you know, so much of it is done through computation uh, and things like that in a very different way. What do you think the next 20 years, where are we going to be? Are we going to genuinely have the kind of glass earth that Syro once promised us we were going to have? Uh, where do you think we're going to be? Yes, uh, so, uh, so uh, I, I think so. Uh, and and uh, I, th I think the concept of the glass earth was a good one, right? And uh, it was perhaps just a little bit ahead of its time, um, where the, the technologies were, were, uh, were not uh, quite there or, uh, to, to build it, or, or, or perhaps the, the, the recognition that it could actually be done and that it should be done uh, was not advanced enough. Right? And another thing that, uh, that I find quite interesting is how the COVID-19 situation is perhaps changing um, and the, uh, the scenarios that we are looking at. Um, because uh, um, COVID will uh, curtail to some extent our ability um, to, to do field work, right? Um, uh, and because international travel uh, will remain problematic for some time, you know, um, et, et, et cetera. And um, certainly at universities, you know, I mean, field work will be done very cautiously uh, for some time. And uh, companies are perhaps in a similar position, I imagine, right? And what that really means is uh, that we have to make a much greater effort uh, to mine existing data. And there's tons of data, there's tons of existing data, and they're just scattered in all sorts of places, and they, and they haven't been put together to maximize uh, their potential uh, for information gain. And uh, uh, so, so I, I see this uh, as a huge challenge and a huge opportunity. I mean, for, for the next uh, decade, right? And to go down that road. And, and I mean, just to follow up on that, because as you know, I, I again, I've had a long, strong interest in this geology area for for a while. Uh, I, I think about uh, geology graduates, uh, and I think about what geology graduates may need to be in the future. And it strikes me they almost need to be more data science and machine learning now than they were, you know, uh, uh, people who uh, went around with pickaxes and that sort of thing. Do you think that's the future? Yeah, uh, uh, absolutely. I mean, I, I, I think that's the future. 
Um, um, but uh, I'm sure, as, as you know yourself, you know, um, uh, universities are quite, uh, um, quite uh, a little bit sluggish to, um, to, to change, their, to adapt their undergraduate uh, programs uh, and to, uh, to embrace uh, these new technologies because it, it, it means uh, changing the composition of your staff. You, know, you, you, you need people you know, with this kind of expertise and, and you, you need them right across all uh, schools, uh, say in the Faculty of Science or right across engineering. You know, uh, I mean, we are, I think what we need is a situation where, where um, every department or school has at least one person uh, uh, who, who is an expert in AI and machine learning and who, who can, who can um, help uh, with the, you know, uh, rolling out of these technologies in, in undergraduate classes and for research projects, right? And uh, um, yeah, so uh, th th that's what is needed and, uh, and, we are, and we are seeing it happening slowly. Good. Actually, I've got a few questions that are now beginning to roll in from the audience. So uh, I might uh, put a few of them uh, from John Greenfield about uh, access to your presentation. I believe your presentation will be on the Chief Scientist website by about four o'clock this afternoon. Uh, I'm told, so uh, your presentation will be available for people to basically look at and download. I've got a second more specific question from Peter Lightbody. Uh, sub subsea mineral extraction, uh, you mentioned a large project uh, off the Australian coast. Can you elaborate? Uh, no, I mean, there's, I, it, all I talked about uh, was the, um, um, the probability map of nodular currents that, uh, that we have created. And uh, that that includes uh, nodule fields um, off the uh, West Australian coast in the um, in this Indian Ocean, and, and, we, and we, are, we are not the first ones to to uh, point out uh, the existence of nodules in those uh, regions. And so we, we have merely um, synthesized them into a coherent map using this multi-dimensional analysis. And so, uh, to my knowledge, there's there's no mining project um, uh, uh, active in that region at the moment. Okay. Uh, I've got a few other questions that are beginning to come through, although uh, it's interesting I'm being given them on pieces of paper. So it's the kind of uh, low tech uh, part of what's going on here. Uh, there's some questions also about using some of the imaging or technologies you've got for, if you like, uh, uh, mining things like waste piles. Uh, so this is from Tom Hunt and Nicholas Flamet, uh, the extraction of, you know, what's going, what, what's been left over in old tailings and things like that. Can we use the same sort of thing or or the techniques are you, you that you've been involving are very much more physical or, or what is there other other opportunities there basically uh and yeah uh, definitely there are opportunities this is, i cannot say that this is my uh, specialty um, um but uh but yeah i i, I know that uh, uh that some uh, geology uh, colleagues of mine are uh, pursuing these opportunities and these um uh, the, I think the opportunities here are a little bit more on the geochemistry side, right? actually trying to figure out uh, how to extract uh, uh, remaining resources from these waste piles. It's, it's, it's not so, so much in exactly locating them. You know? You've got a waste pile and, and you pretty much know uh, what's there. Right? And so the, the question is, uh, it's, it's, it's nearly more of, an, of a chemical engineering question. Right? It's about how, how do you actually get the uh, get the yeah. minerals out? Yep, that makes that makes good sense. Look, uh, I love the stuff uh, that you're doing. I really, you know, I think I think the thing that really inspires me is not just that the the data is really delivering new science, but the fact that actually you're making this sort of area so much more accessible to everybody, uh, to the public, to the general interest, to the understanding our environment and everything. So. Dietmar, uh, once again, thank you for a great presentation. I think we prearranged uh, to give you a, a book and a nice uh, bottle of Hunter Valley red wine, uh, which I think you can show to people. Indeed. There you go. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Even in the virtual world, there have to be some physical, uh, some physical things. And I want to thank uh, everyone for great. I want to thank everyone for uh, uh, joining us uh, this morning. Uh, a few teething problems. We'll make sure that we uh, get right next time, or I'll make sure I get it right next time. But I do want to uh, mention our next uh, speaker. So uh, we will have our next uh, uh, talk on the 1st of July, on Wednesday, the 1st of July, again uh, at 8 a.m. 
and it'll be Professor Liz Pelicano uh, from Macquarie University, and she'll be presenting on autism, uh, some really, really great uh, work uh, uh, that's going on at Macquarie uh, in lots of different areas around autism, so knowing autism. So we, we will welcome everyone uh, to the talk uh, on uh, Wednesday, the 1st of July. So thank you very much again for attending. Thank you very much, uh, Dietmar, for a great presentation.